Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sunday School. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, the time changed last night, and so I think that may be affecting me. <clears throat> Didn't affect our turnout. We have a good turnout. We, we appreciate you, uh, you guys and girls getting up and getting going. <laughs> the spring forward seems to throw me sometimes. You know, it's like, uh, I'm ready for the fall back. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'll be looking for that hour in, <laughs> for a while now, but <laughs> praise the Lord! What a week, Amen. We've had a quite a uh, quite a beginning to the month of March in the Thompson family. I can tell you that for sure, and so uh, I imagine the same for you. You know, so many things happening in in life and in the world. All around us, there's so many things going on us, and in the midst of it, the Lord is faithful. So that's the wonderful, the wonderful good news that we have. And after our uh, our session last uh, Sunday morning, and uh, Michelle's preparation, and mentioning that this week we were going to be. Uh, Covering chapter three, I'm surprised it's not packed a packed house. Every uh, every husband bringing his wife, and every wife bringing her husband. So you need to hear this. <laughs> so uh, it's a continuation continuation of the XO conference here we got this morning. But uh, praise the Lord, we uh, we love this chapter and we love this book. I tell you, it's speaking to us. We love the. The Word of God in general, and so we're we're learning that in every season of life, in every season of life, this Word can speak revelation to us. It can speak life to us, life to our situation, and uh, I love that that uh, worship song. Well, it's a worship and and praise song that you you can hear it on the radio, probably quite a bit. But it's a young man, actually a very uh, young man, that sings it, but it. It talks about in, in the verse, it says, uh, or in the course, I don't want to miss one word you speak because everything you say is life to me. Amen. And that's what this word is. There's, there's mysteries in here that sometimes on your first reading, you may not fully grasp or get a hold of. So that's why we are, as the children of God, as the sons and daughters, we're called to be kings and priests. And it says a king searches a matter out. And so if there's something you, you don't grasp fully the first time you read it, keep reading and pray, Holy Spirit, bring revelation to my soul. Bring revelation to my spirit and give me understanding of your word. Help me to understand your word that I'll be able to serve you better. I'll be able to live for you in a, in a greater measure, at a greater degree through all the seasons of my life. And it's exciting to see that... Uh, as the we're we're about to hit spring here. Anybody ready for spring? <laughs> I'm ready for spring, and uh, it's it's here. It's upon us. This is uh, spring break week for those of you who keep a track of that thing. And I know uh, on my job we keep track of that because this is really the mark of uh, the busy season for the year. From here, and then next thing you know, it's going to be summer, and and uh, people, everyone will want to go somewhere. <laughs> and uh, so praise the Lord. We're, we're thankful that in, in the midst of a chaotic world situation here in the U.S., although it may cost you a premium price, we still are able to, to come and go, praise the Lord, and getting more and more freedom because uh, more people are lifting the mask re requirements and mandates and of every kind are falling by the way, and so we praise the Lord for that. And uh, so we're looking for a return to uh, freedom in America, but also in the church. We're expecting some exciting things in this year, this year coming up. And so in our, I know our, uh, the subject of our lesson today is, is 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to get into that in just a moment. But I, I did want to mention this uh, from a devotional that was one of the, our, our morning devotionals. If you've been following the, the morning devotionals with Dutch, it was late last month. But this, this one came, 
And uh, I just was going to read this portion of Scripture because I feel like it's so exciting to hear this in the world situation we're in right now. Because if you look on the world stage, it looks one way. But this is uh, a quote from, said, uh, as I was praying and asking for insight into this year of 2022, I very clearly heard the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, tell me this would be a year of restoration. A year of restoration. And so when we look around, it's like, whoa. I'm not seeing that yet. <laughs> and yet we hear, he said, very clearly heard the Spirit say. And so how many of you know sometimes what we see with our natural eyes doesn't line up with what is going on in the spirit realm and the spiritual side? And so I'm going to agree with this word, this rhema word. I'm going to agree with it. And yes, we are seeing restoration in family. We had some uh, exciting uh, things even this week of restoration of family relationships and so happy to be able to love. I tell you, if you just, if you love your family and keep reaching out to them, it can, uh, it can change things. It can change things. And so we want to encourage you in that regard. But he goes on to say, he said, he then said to me, I am the God of every moment. Therefore, no moment is wasted. And so I, I want to just encourage you to hear the call in this hour and in this moment to be an intercessor and be determined that no matter what I see, I'm going to keep praying the word of God. I'm going to keep hearing what the prophets have to say. I'm going to keep hearing what the, the men of God have to say, men and women of God have to say in this hour, what they're hearing in the spirit, and I'm going to believe for that. And so... We're believing this word that this year, 2022, is going to be a year of restoration, a year of restoration. And so that's what we're looking for. And so I want to encourage you to be praying into that, because when you begin to pray the word of God, when you begin to pray this word in faith, believing in your heart, you pray what the word says. You begin to pray and you intercede for it and say, Lord, I'm going to I'm going to hold fast my confession that this is going to be a year of restoration and then allow the Holy Spirit to bring it about. Then you, you are a participant in the word of God. You're also a participant in the word of prophecy. And so I want to encourage you to pursue that office of, a, of an intercessor, to be an intercessor, to pray for the body, to pray for the kingdom of God. And so we're praying. We're praying right in line with the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come, Lord. Your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. And so when we begin to pray prayers like this, this is going to be a year of restoration. We're agreeing with the Holy Spirit. And so we, became, we become a prophetic voice that continues to speak into revelation into, into this earth, into this earth realm. And so we'll begin, we will see it as we continue to pray, as we come into line with the word of God and with his truth and with his plan. And so I want to encourage you, keep praying, keep believing, because God is a redeemer and a restorer, a redeemer and a restorer. And he, he went on in this devotion to, and this is, this is really the heart of what I wanted to share from this, because it says the biblical meaning of the word restoration is much different than the English definition. It says the dictionary defines it as returning something back to its original condition. However, the biblical meaning is to restore back more than has been lost. So if you feel like you've lost something, guess what? God is a redeemer, and God is a in the restoration business. It says, causing the final state to be greater than the original condition. It says, the point is of that, the point is that someone or something is actually improved in biblical restoration. I'm going to believe the Bible because I want some of that. <laughs> you know, sometimes we feel like in life, it's like, oh, you know, these years and these, 
these things that we're going through take a toll on us. It's like we lose, lose a few things here and there. But God is a God of restoration. And so when he restores to, into your life, he gives you back more. He gives you back more than you lost. And so I just want to encourage you, don't fall for the devil's tricks and the things that he may present and say, oh, you know, well, we can't even get into what the devil says because he says a lot. <laughs> he says a lot, and he'll try to bring discouragement into your spirit and keep you from praying and keep you from reading the word, but we're going to hold fast our confession. We're going to declare this is a year of restoration, and when God brings the restoration, it's better than it was before. It comes back better than it was before. Think about that in, even in the life of Job. Job got more than he lost. He received more than he lost for his time and for his effort, and, and he kept his heart before the Lord. And so I want to encourage you, be faithful to the Lord and to the voice of the Holy Spirit that's speaking into your life and know that, that this is going to be a year of re restoration. So we're coming into this halfway through the third month. Man, these days are just flying. They are just flying. So in the Thompson family, we do a lot of celebrating in the month of March. And so we're believing, we're celebrating by faith. This is a great year. It's a good year to be alive and to praise and to worship the Lord. And hallelujah. I don't have my slideshow ready today, so y'all are y'all are okay. So, <laughs> so here we go. First Peter chapter three it says, "In the same way, you wives must accept the authority of your husbands. Then, even if some refuse to obey the good news, your godly lives will speak to them without any words. They will be won over by observing your pure." and reverent lives. Verse 3, don't be concerned about the outward beauty of fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry, or beautiful clothes. You should clothe, yourself, clothe yourselves instead with the beauty that comes from within, the unfaded beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is so precious to God. This is how the holy women of old made themselves beautiful. They put their trust in God and accepted the authority of their husbands. For instance, Sarah obeyed her, mas her husband, Abraham, and even called him, Carl, excuse me. For instance, Sarah obeyed her husband, Abraham, and called him her master. You are her daughters when you do what is right without fear of what your husbands might do. And so, starting right off into this chapter, I'll tell you what, it is getting right into the midst of it. And as, uh, <laughs> as we mentioned from, from last week, you know, um, the, the closing out of, of the uh, of two was submission to master. It was talking about servants in master relationship. And so when, when it seems abrupt and in, in it, it just starting off with this message to wives and you know, the, the culture that we live in so many times would reject a message like this. However, we're looking beyond what the culture has to say, and we're seeing that uh, in our culture that we're living in, that it wants to say it, it has a mixed message for women, and, and it wants to present all of these messages for women of feminism, and yet... What the word is, is speaking forth is what is going to value a woman and what is going to prepare her to come into her fullness. And I think that one of the things is it's showing such trust in God, such trust in the Heavenly Father and his plan for your life to say, I'm going to live according to the word of God. And so there's there's portions of this message that apply so equally to men and for, uh, for all of us to learn to do what is right and have a determination in our heart and in our spirit that I'm going to do what's right 
I'm going to live my life right before God and know that as I endeavor to please him, he's going to cause my way to be blessed, cause my way to be blessed in every, every area and every aspect. And so, as I mentioned, uh, even last week, that when it comes to speaking to wives, that uh, I'm glad to hear what any of our wives have to say. So if any of the ladies would like to speak to this uh, portion of Scripture, you know, we'll definitely give you the mic and let you speak and see, you know, if, if you have a specific uh, illustration of how this has blessed you, of how this particular passage has blessed you. But I'm telling you, we, even when we don't understand it fully in our mind or our comprehension, we cannot, buy, we cannot go wrong by obeying and by living by the word of God, the word of truth. And so, anybody have a comment about those? Lynn, come on. Come on down. <laughs> I'll come to you. That's all right. Hang on. I guess this is not this is not actually biblical. It doesn't come, you know, straight out of the Bible. But I've always believed that uh, the man is the head of the household, but I also believe that the woman is the heart of the household. And I, I don't think that one can function without the other. Well, that's absolutely, that's absolutely biblical in the sense of the relationship of a husband and wife. It's a, it's a melding of their hearts and lives together. And it's, you know, two become one. And over time is where we really see that. I mean, it's not, that's not going to happen in the first uh, month, the first year, the first probably five years or even ten. For two to become one. It is a, it's a lifetime adventure and relationship of learning one another and of learning from one another. And Michelle had mentioned some things last week. And, uh, you know, we all have a nature and character that we're, that we're born with. And when we come into relationship with our, with our wife, we can see how they live. We can see how their family lived and, and did things. And there's characteristics I recognize in my wife that it's like, oh, yeah, I, I need some of that. <laughs> I need some of her organizational skills in my life to get more done, to accomplish more. And there's other aspects that I recognize and admire through relationship. It's because over a period of time I see, wow, I value her more in her relationship her contributions to our relationship, our marriage, and our family so much more now than I, than I did even at the beginning. And there's, there's things, especially when it comes to our, our children and insights into our children, it's like, dear, why don't you speak to that? Why don't you <laughs> tell me what you think about that? And it's been, I mean, it's just, it's been, it bears good fruit. It bears good fruit to be able to, hear what she has to say, and us come to that place of, of, uh, of sharing and, you know, yes, I'm becoming more like her along the way. There's aspects she mentioned last week that she had learned from me, and I just think that's the nature of what marriage is supposed to be, and it doesn't happen overnight, as I mentioned, but through time and situations and working through situations together, I mean, it's such a blessing. I'm coming, Linda. I I saw that. Basically, one of the things that stuck out to me was in verse 4 also where it says, you should clothe yourselves instead with the beauty that comes from within, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is so precious to God. And I remember as part of my mentorship that uh, one of the scriptures that, that was a similar scripture to this that talked about putting on that tender-hearted spirit or putting on, you know, and... Uh, I remember 
uh, just, I used to say, that's just my personality. I just have to say what I think. Well, after many years of getting in trouble, yeah, <laughs> he does have a daughter like that. <laughs> and um, I'm like, you actually don't have to say everything you think. I learned that. And I'll save you a lot of grief if you'll go ahead and learn it now. <laughs> and uh, but, but a lot of people will say that. You know, well, that's just the way God made me. That's just the personality he gave me, which that is true. He gave you a personality, but he wouldn't have written so many things of clothe yourself with. So what that was telling me, God was showing me, is this is something that's different than your carnal nature. You're going to have to choose to put on this when you want to. And I, and I was just telling, I think I might have shared that last week, is just my level of peace as I begin to apply God's principles, and I tell a lot of girls that talk to me that are engaged or they're, you know, talking about marriage, that when you're looking for a husband, so many girls, when you ask them about uh, what can, you know, what, what, what's your fiancé like? Or, what? oh, he's going to do this for me and do this for me and do this for me, bring me things, take me out, he buys me things and all that. And I'm like, just so you know, that, that probably, you probably won't be fulfilled if that's all you're looking for. I said, because as women, God created us as their helpmeet. And that means that we're going to help them become who God created them to be. And that's how we'll be fulfilled. And uh, the, I'm constantly, and you, you know that, I'm constantly asking, is there anything you want to do, anything I can do to what's something you want to do, like any, any new ministry or anything different that you want to do? And I just think that it's important to realize that God created us for that role, and so we're not going to be fulfilled if we keep trying to be in charge or we keep trying to fix our husbands or be our, be our husband's mother or teacher or whatever, and that, that, that this is another example. If you're just doing it God's way, you're adapting. The Amplified Version says to adapt to your husband, to prefer his way. As you do that, you find so much joy and fulfillment in that. Bringing things into focus. This all helps us when we're all doing it Together. Well, I'm, of course, I'm not married now, but I have been, and I know all about this kind of stuff for sure through much trial and error. But um, one time I was uh, part of a group called Sarah's Daughters, and it was based in this passage right here. And because we hadn't read that yet, I don't think, but where it says Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, I'm reading from the King James. Uh, whose daughters you are, as long as you do well and not are, af not are afraid with any amazement. And so, you know, because some decisions men make can just strike terror to your heart. They, I mean, you know, they're, they're bolder in some ways, you know, and adventurous. And uh, anyway, that's why they need to help me. But at any rate, that, that uh, afraid without any amazement, if you think about Sarah, Abraham comes home one day and says, you know what? We're leaving, and we don't know where we're going. <laughs> that would be terror to a woman's heart who's a nester. <laughs> you know, we like our little house all set up, you know. So um, in that class, it was real valuable how we helped one another and supported one another because it does say that she'll win him without a word, by, and she'll win him with her lifestyle. He, he will observe that because she has a quiet spirit, and uh, she's not always ranting and raving and nagging and carrying on and all that. So this is a wonderful passage just for all women, of course, but especially if you've got a husband who doesn't obey the word, especially then. <laughs> I'll tell you what, this is a uh, exciting, and I, I like to... In situations, especially like this, I like to have interaction to hear what you're saying or hear what you're thinking about the scriptures. And one of the things that Michelle had brought up while ago brought this to light as well. The, the thing is, when we're coming together as a husband and wife, it's not just me as an individual and Michelle as an individual, but how many of you know that, that we have families 
And so because we have families, we have family history. And so in some regards, the family history blends good things. In some regards, the family history may take you off track. <laughs> and so, you know, fortunately for us, we, we have some excellent aspects of our family heritage. And I mean, many, uh, there's, there's a lot of ministry heritage in Michelle's family of the Townsend side, as well as her, her mother's side, the Lambert side. And uh, she had a grandmother that was a minister. And then on the, on the Townsend side, they had multiple uh, history of, of uh, living for the Lord and longstanding uh, good testimony. And then same thing, you know, on our side, I have a grandmother who, who prayed and then a great-grandmother who prayed and loved the Lord. And even my, my grandmother got filled with the Holy Spirit as a young girl and then carried that into her her life, and I think that especially affected my dad and, and his brother that Granny prayed, and she prayed in the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and, and so many, you know, wonderful aspects of the heritage. But something, I can't remember what happened uh, in the last uh, week or so. You know, life's always exciting when, you're, when your parents are in your household and one of your children and grandchildren are in the household. I mean, it just makes for all kinds of wonderful things. But... Uh, I can't remember exactly what come up, but uh, uh, Michelle made the comment, well, now we know that uh, where was Brooklyn gets her poker face. And uh, my, my, I have two daughters that are very expressive and uh, uh, outwardly expressive, but they are not real good. At, I don't know if they play poker, but they probably shouldn't <laughs> because sometimes if they think it it's just like one thought and then whoop, it pops right out something dad my dad had had said something last week and and uh, and he made this face this is like no that wasn't going to work for him and uh but I've seen that so many times in my daughters of, of uh, them have a thought and they don't have to say anything Oh, coffee ice cream was when he just couldn't blend the two together. He loves coffee and he loves ice cream, but the two, the thought of the two, I think, didn't work for him. And uh, <laughs> and so I have these daughters that uh, are very quick to. You can read their. Well, I can read their face. Mo, the world can read their face. You know. <laughs> and so we see in that a, a generational aspect to life, and that you know it came from. From Papa, you know, right through Dad, because sometimes I can be the same way. If I smell something I don't like, you know, it's food related. A lot of things in my life are related to food. However, I don't know why. <laughs> my mom was an excellent cook. <laughs> that may be generational too, but uh, so then the daughters are the same way, and so you know we see that in. You know, I'm talking about food. That's we can make that light, but. There are other characteristics that are passed down just as just in the same manner, same way that it was in Papa, it's in the son, it's in the, the grandchildren, and it's in the great grandchildren. And so there are generational aspects of life that are good and bad. And so we, that's why we do, we pray these prayer of the Lord's Prayer. Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done in my life. Forgive me of my trespasses. Forgive me of my sins. We pray that prayer. And Lord, cleanse me from all my iniquities. You know, anything that's passed down from a generational aspect. Lord, I want to be cleansed of that. I want every iniquity be, to be cut off with my, with my generation. And I want the, the further the generations going forward in, in my family tree to be a generation that worships the Lord, that praises the Lord, that brings glory and honor to him and allows his word to work in their life. And so we pray that prayer. And as I was mentioned earlier, we become an intercessor for our family tree. So we pray for, I pray for, for me and my wife. We pray for our children. And so that is something that in a positive sense is passed on because my grandmother used to pray, pray for our family and for me and my brothers, and the Lord spoke to her, 
And I think I may have shared it one, once before, but one night she called my, my dad and said, hey, what's going on with Philip? And he's like, uh, well, I don't know. I, I'm calling check. He was, uh, he was in the Air Force at the time and it was stationed, and he was a young man and very rambunctious. And uh, so anyway, long story short, he called, my dad called him up and said, hey, Philip, what's going on? And uh, he said, Dad, you will not believe what happened to me last night. He said, I was on a motorcycle, and I was going down the road, and I turned a little too sharp, and that motorcycle just slid, and I was on the road. And he said, well, he said, you're, you're in luck this time because your grandmother was up praying for you, and she saw just that thing, that you were on a motorcycle, and you're coming down, and you turned too sharp and slid, and she was praying for you. And so, thank the Lord. <laughs> thank the Lord. And so, I want, that's where I'm saying you can be an intercessor for your family and for the generations that come after you. And, you know, when, when uh, you're, like, I think about our, our grandchildren at this point are so small and, and young and everything they do is fun and exciting to us. <laughs> Maybe not to everybody else, but to us. But you think about that in the progression of time those kids grow up, and so they need us to be intercessors for their life to pray protection and guidance and direction and speak into their life, and so the same thing is true for you and for your family and your family tree, and for, for, you, for you ladies, this was the word that came forth, that by doing the right thing, that God takes up your case, that God will be in charge of your life. Michelle mentioned her mentorship, and uh, Miss Nancy, Nancy uh, was in the church where we used to uh, used to attend. But I've I've known her a long time as well, and I knew some of her children, and uh, well, we both did. And but I just think that you know, in so many ways, her character came out in the things that she would share with Michelle, and Michelle learned so much from her, and she still shares some of those little nuggets occasionally in, in, uh, in life. And, and there's times where I'm like, thank you, Miss Nancy. <laughs> thank you for sowing into my wife, which actually sowed into our family. It sowed into our children and into their lives and into their character and the young men that they have become. Yes, she is. Yes, she is. Well, I, I, the other thing that I wanted to mention about that, uh, we, Michelle and I had gone over to a, a service to meet uh, Nancy and her mom. Had gone at a service. This has been probably I don't know five or seven, eight, nine years ago, and uh, we'd gone to a service they were having at their church. And Hank Hank Kuhneman was there speaking that night, and first time I'd really heard him prophetic voice and got up and spoke, and we really enjoyed it and had a had a great time and. We're treated very lovely there and had, had a wonderful time. But one of the things I've heard Hank say regarding him and his wife, he said, well, he said, I know and understand that, you know, we're not going to be married in heaven. But he said, you know, just like Brenda and I are best friends. So I've just, I've talked to the Lord about maybe just sharing a mansion together. <laughs> and uh, so that's what happens in relationship when you, you know, meld your life together, and you become that. You become best friends, and you minister to one another. And so that's, that's really the place that we're going to, is to be able to see your relationship as a ministry. You're ministering to your husband. Your husband's ministering to you. And so that's right where we're getting to right now, verse 7. So here we go. Husbands, in the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, and that's what that's referring to is physically. Yes, I'm stronger than my wife. Praise the Lord. <laughs> so if uh, things that need to, now I work with some really, you know, strong girls at, uh, at, at work. But uh, <laughs> we won't get into that. <laughs> but uh, treat your wife with understanding as you live together. 
She may be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. And that is what we need to focus on. We need to see that, and we need to focus that she's your equal partner. And so that's where we come together in relationship, in kingdom kingdom relationship and kingdom ministry. And so that's what we want to do is we want to keep, keep the kingdom of God in focus in our life and realize that the things that we do in this life are preparation for our eternity. Okay, yes, there's wonderful things, there's wonderful times that we have together, but this life that we're living, that we're so loving in so many ways, it's preparation for our our eternal relationship with the Lord. And so that's, I mean, we, in, in marriage, you can learn so much from your spouse, and you can learn so much about life by seeing through their, through their lens and through their understanding because, you know, I can just tell you, you know, my family saw things one way growing up, and now as I've matured and I have a, a greater, wider field of range, I can say, wow, yeah, that was one way that we did it out there in West Texas. <laughs> way out there in West Texas. And... Uh, um, but that's not the only way. And so now I have the maturity to, to, to glean from other families, from other understanding, and through years of, of studying the Word. But also, I mean, just as simple a thing as going to the XO conference, we've learned in these last 10 years, you know, a lot about relationship about marriage, about ministering to one another. And there's so many times it's like, oh, I want all my, I want my kids to know all this stuff. <laughs> How do I make this transfer? How do I make the transfer from all the stuff that's in my head and in my heart to my children? Well, that happens by relationship. That happens by relationship. And when they, they see your success in life, it'll make them come and say, hey, Dad, How'd you do that? You know, hey, mom, how'd you do that? And then you have the opportunity to share and you have the opportunity to to minister life to the next generation. And so that's what we want to see. That's what we want to see is the, the raising up of many godly generations here at Family Life. And so we're praying for our current church family but we're also praying into the future. Lord, we're praying for that Josiah generation. We want to see those kids rise up to be great for the kingdom. We want to see them love God with all their heart. And whatever they choose to do, they may be a doctor or a lawyer. We want them to be a Christian doctor or a lawyer or a statesman or a politician because we need some godly Christian politicians in Washington, in Texas, in Houston, right here in Spring, Texas. We need people on the school board that love the Lord and are willing to stand for what the Bible says. And so it happens on the grassroots level. So we're praying, Lord, raise up godly families here in family life. And it starts with what this chapter is talking about, men and women men and women who will submit themselves to God and say, God, I want to have godly character. I want to have, I want to do, I want to live my life in a way that's pleasing to you. And I know that when I'm pleasing you, I'm going to bless my wife. I know that when my wife is pleasing you, she's going to bless me. And so this is what, this is real Christian life. That's what this chapter is about. In the same way you husbands must give honor to your wives, treat your wife with understanding. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. Let me tell you, understanding of women, we could have a whole men's conference on that. <laughs> we, could have a, we could have a whole men's conference on that, and uh, we could preach for, for a week or so. And then when we got done, we'd say, hey, 
we need to have part two next week because I know y'all didn't get it. <laughs> I know y'all didn't get it this week, so we're coming back next week, <laughs> and we could carry that on for a while. I don't know about you, but I grew up with brothers, and so in our, in our family growing up, it was football, it was basketball, it was baseball, it was golf, it was fishing, camping, hiking, it was all this manly stuff, you know, and hunting and shooting guns. Oh, man, we loved all of that. But my, my uh, knowledge quotient of women was, was not great. <laughs> was not great. So, you know, the thing is we need to be sure we pass some of this understanding on to our young men and our young women as well. Uh, and so that's one of the great things about having a youth pastor like Adrian, who every year will continue to speak on the, import, the importance of love, the importance of having right relationship, and speaking these principles to our young people. So praise the Lord. We could go round two on that and read that whole, those three verses again. Uh, but no. Uh, finally, all Christians... Hang on, I wanted to read this. Uh, there was one. Now that we've read through those, I would like to read them again in this, the message. And I like this. It says, the same goes for you wives. Be good wives to your husbands, responsive to their needs. There are husbands who, indifferent as they are in any words about God, will be captivated by your life of holy beauty. Wow, what a word. And I, I actually know several families that that happened. When, when we were young, young men or kids, the husband didn't come to church. He was an oil field worker. He was working. He was, you know, busy, busy doing all this stuff. He didn't go to church, but his wife always came to church. His wife always brought the kids to church. And that happened in a couple of families that I grew up with. And you know what happened in later in life? those men got saved because they had a godly wife who kept going to church, kept taking their kids to church, kept doing what was right, and it changed those men. It changed those men. It changed their life. And I, I, know, I know one of them still alive and living over here in, uh, in East Texas. And his first wife passed away, and now he's remarried. But that first wife, because she was a believer, she kept loving the Lord, kept going to church. It was a godly influence and changed his life. And I even have an uncle that, that that similar, real similar thing. All through his working career, he was working. He was going to work. He was a truck driver running a trucking company. And he was so busy, and he was going, going, going. And next thing you know, he's retired. And guess what? He's like, whoa. Well, let's go to church. <laughs> then he started going to church, got saved, loved the Lord, and then he'd call my parents up and say, yeah, I'm sitting here watching the 700 Club this morning. And it's like, oh, my Lord, what happened to him? His wife kept living for the Lord even while he was out here doing his thing. And so this word is true, and it really works. It really works. If you will live it, it will work. It'll work in your life. So let's, let's read on just a a little bit further in this, in this version, because I, I like it. There are husbands who, indifferent as they are to any words about God, will be captivated by your life of holy beauty. What matters is not your outer appearance, the styling of your hair, the jewelry you wear, the cut of your clothes, but your inner disposition. Cultivate inner beauty, the gentle, gracious kind that God delights in. The holy women of old were beautiful before God that way and were good, loyal wives to their husbands. Sarah, for instance, taking care of Abraham, would address him as my dear husband. I love that. That's beautiful. <laughs> as my dear husband. You will be true daughters of Sarah if you do the same, unanxious and unintimidated. You can be that Proverbs, Proverbs 31 woman. You can be successful in business. You can be successful and have and just allow the godly character to shine through for all to see. And it, it'll, it'll, 
have an impact on your family, but beyond your family, it'll impact, it'll impact the world. And so live it. Live your life for Jesus. The same goes for your husbands. Be good husbands to your wives. Honor them. Delight in them. As women, they lack some of your advantages, but in the new life of God's grace, you're equals. Treat your wives then as equals so your prayers don't run aground. Woo, that is such a powerful scripture right there. Treat your wife right so the Lord will hear your prayers. That's what it's saying. I know in the Old Testament, was it Abigail? Is that the right one that I'm thinking of that uh, saved her husband's life? (laughs) Saved his life. It's like she came out to meet David, brought the offering, brought the intercession group, said, hey, whoa, hey, hey. Oh, he didn't mean that like that. (laughs) So she interceded on his behalf and basically and saved his life. Saved his hide. And so, wives, you are precious. You are precious. So, let's continue on. Finally, all of you should be of one mind. Sympathize with each other. Love each other as brothers and sisters. Be tenderhearted and keep a humble attitude. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do, and he will grant you his blessing. For the scripture says, the scriptures say, if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. So again, it's a great reminder because sometimes in in situations where we get anxious or we get uptight or we, you know, we're under pressure, we can, you know, forget to keep the the rain in on our tongue. And so as men, sometimes we can get boisterous and loud and maybe even obnoxious. And so, you know, our, our family sees that. Our children see that. People that we work with see that. And so keep your tongue under control. Keep your tongue and keep your, keep your attitude and know that the Lord is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. It says, if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, keep your tongue from speaking evil. Lord, help me. That's where we had to pray it every day. We had to pray it. It's like, take those words back. <laughs> Whoops, too late, too late. So it's then like, oh, I gotta pray. Lord, help me control my tongue. Help me control what I say and how I say it. And that's so important. So important in our lives, what I say and how I say it. So keep my tongue from speaking evil. Keep your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. So I want to be in that camp that's doing right. Lord, I want, to, I want to do it right. And so we pray that prayer. We say, Lord, I want to live for you according to your word. Help me, Holy Spirit, come alongside me. Be my helper. Help me to maintain the right attitude. Help me to say the right things. Help me not to say. If there's things I shouldn't say, help me. Help me, Holy Spirit. Now, who will want to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you. God will reward you. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Instead, you must worship. You must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. Can you do that? Can you do it? Can you share your testimony at the, at just the blink, at just the, do you have a, a ready word of how the Lord has blessed you, how he's blessed your life, he's blessed your family, he's blessed you in so many ways? Have that word and say, Lord, help me to be ready to share a, a good word, a good testimony. Help me to be ready in a world that is so cynical to share the truth and to share it with love and compassion. 
Keep your conscience clear. Then if some speak, if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. This word works. I'm telling you, it works. Put it into practice. Remember, it is better to suffer for doing good, if that is what God wants, than to suffer for doing wrong. Amen. <laughs> Amen. If I have to suffer, I'd rather suffer for doing good. I'd rather suffer for doing good. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. So he went and preached to the spirits in prison, those who disobeyed God long ago when God waited patiently while Noah was building his boat. Only eight people were saved from drowning in that terrible flood. And that water is a picture of baptism, which now saves you, not by removing dirt from your body, but as a response to God from a clean conscience. It's effective because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So that becomes our prayer. Lord, let that resurrection power, that same spirit that raised you up from the dead, let it dwell in me. Let your spirit dwell in me. Let it live boldly and strong in me. Let it rise up and cause my old man, my old nature to be put to death. So when I went down in baptism and I raised to new life in Christ, that's the picture that it paints. And so as many of you have, have been baptized, then that's, that's the picture of new life that we, that we represent in the world that we've risen to new life, so we need to allow the Holy Spirit to flow through us and to bring forth that resurrection power of Christ so that we can have an influence, so that we can have an influence in the world. And all of us do. We all have an influence. We all have a, a uh, reputation. And so let your reputation be one that points people toward Christ. Let it cause them to have hope. Let them, you know, if somebody's going to ask you something, you know, how about, why are you so happy? <laughs> why are you so happy when all this stuff's going on? Actions speak louder than words. And people, people are watching you, whether you, they, they may not come out and say it, but they are. They're watching to see what's going on in your life. It says, now God, now Christ has gone to heaven. He is seated in the place of honor next to God and all the angels and authorities and powers accept his authority. So we know that Christ is at the right hand of the Father. And because he was faithful to his calling, it says he's been highly exalted and has all power in heaven and earth. And so we have an appeal that we can make. If, you, if there's challenges in your life, you can appeal to heaven. If there's things going on in, in, at work, at really any area of life, we have this, this truth that we can appeal to heaven because our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer is at the right hand of the Father. And remember, this is a year of restoration. And remember that when he restores he gives you back more. He gives you back more. So we believe in biblical restoration. So it's like, Lord, I want more of you. I want more of your Holy Spirit working in my life. I want more of your Holy Spirit working in my family. My kids need the Holy Spirit. Lord, I want all of my kids to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I want my grandkids to know you and to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to have a revelation. And so, I want to encourage you once again as we're closing to take up that, that ministry of intercession. Be an intercession. In I'll get it out in one second. Become an intercessor for your family and for the generations that are coming after you. And, and thereby, when you do that, when you begin to pray this word over your children, you begin to prophesy into their life. You begin to prophesy into your, your grandchildren and into their life. So speak the word of God over your children. Speak the word of God over your grandchildren. 
and say, I'm going to be a participator in this, in this life, in this kingdom life, that in eternity, I'm going to see my children, I'm going to see my grandchildren, and we're going to serve God forever. We're going to worship God forever. And even to the point of you may not see yourself as a prophet, but I'm saying when you enter into this, enter into this ministry of intercession for your family and for your family tree, you can begin to prophesy over them and see good things happen in their lives. So let's close with prayer, and we're just asking the Lord to help us. I feel like one of the, the main messages of this whole chapter is just to do what's right. How do we know that? Well, each and every one of us have a conscience. We have a conscience that speaks into our life. And so as adults, as adult Christians who've been saved and filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is able to speak to you on a daily basis and give you guidance, give you revelation, give you understanding of this word. And if there's areas that, that you're saying, you know, I, I really don't understand that part of the Bible. Well, what you need to do is you start praying and you say, Holy Spirit, speak to me. And guess what? He will do it. If he needs to give you a dream, a vision, if he needs to send someone along the way, if he needs to have, have Jay LaRue come to our service and stand in front of you and explain a particular portion of Scripture, guess what? He will do it. He will do it. The Lord is good that way. He will answer your prayers, and he, you know, the Bible's willing that any should perish. And so especially for his church and those of the household of faith, we want, our expectation is that we're going to live for the Lord. We're going to be successful in that, and we're going to see supernatural revival hit Spring, Texas this year. Amen. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for your word today. We thank you for the opportunity to share together. Lord, we are so invested in you and in your kingdom. Thank you for all that you're doing for us, for all that you've provided for us, for salvation, for the blessings and your mercies that are renewed every day. We just thank you today. We come with a thankful and a grateful heart to praise you and to worship you. And we say, come, Holy Spirit, fill our lives. Fill us with your understanding, with your wisdom. Cause us to have a, a new and a greater love for your word for the revelation that you've given to us and help us in the, in the living out. Help us in this aspect of living out your word that we will live in such a way that we're pointing everyone that we meet. We're pointing all to you and to your kingdom. And we're saying, come all who are thirsty. Come those who are weary. Come and be filled with the richness and with the fullness of our Lord and of our Savior. He feels to the uttermost. He feels, he fulfills, and he brings complete and total restoration into our lives. So we just praise you today. We thank you for all that you're at work doing, and we say, come and have your way in our life, in our home, and here in our church. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Join us at 1030.